Chapter Sixteen of the Absentee by Maria Edgeworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In what words of polite circumlocution or of cautious diplomacy shall we say or hint that the deceased ambassador's papers were found in shameful disorder? His Excellency's executor, Sir James Brooke, however, was indefatigable in his researches he and lord colambre spent two whole days in looking over portfolios of letters and memorials and manifestos and bundles of paper of the most heterogeneous sorts some of them without any docket or direction to lead to a knowledge of their contents others written upon in such a manner as to give an erroneous notion of their nature so that it was necessary to untie every paper separately at last when they had opened as they thought every paper and wearied and in despair were just on the point of giving up the search lord colambre spied a bundle of old newspapers at the bottom of a trunk they are only old vienna gazettes i looked at them said sir james lord colambre upon this assurance was going to throw them into the trunk again but observing that the bundle had not been untied he opened it and with inside of the newspapers he found a rough copy of the ambassador's journal and with it the packet directed to ralph reynolds senior esq old court suffolk per favour of his excellency earl blank a note on the cover signed o'halloran stating when received by him and the date of the day when delivered to the ambassador seals unbroken our hero was in such a transport of joy at the sight of this packet and his friend sir james brooke so full of his congratulations that they forgot to curse the ambassador's carelessness which had been the cause of so much evil the next thing to be done was to deliver the packet to ralph reynolds old court suffolk but when lord colambre arrived at old court suffolk he found all the gates locked and no admittance to be had at last an old woman came out of the porter's lodge who said mr reynolds was not there and she could not say where he was after our hero had opened her heart by the present of half a guinea she explained that she could not justly say where he was because that he never let anybody of his own people know where he was any day he had several different houses and places in different parts and far-off counties and other shires as she heard and by times he was at one and by times at another the names of two of the places todrington and little restham she knew but there were others to which she could give no direction he had houses in odd parts of london too that he let and sometimes when the lodger's time was out he would go and be never heard of for a month maybe in one of them in short there was no telling or saying where he was or would be one day of the week by where he had been the last when lord colambre expressed some surprise that an old gentleman as he conceived mr ralph reynolds to be should change places so frequently the old woman answered that though her master was a deal on the wrong side of seventy and though to look at him you'd think he was glued to his chair and would fall to pieces if he should stir out of it yet he was as alert and thought no more of going about than if he was as young as the gentleman who was now speaking to her it was old mr reynolds's delight to come down and surprise his people at his different places and see that they were keeping all tight what sort of man is he is he a miser said lord colambre he is a miser and he is not a miser said the woman now he'd think as much of the waste of a penny as another man would of a hundred pounds and yet he would give a hundred pounds easier than another would give a penny when he's in the humour but his humour is very odd and there's no knowing where to have him he's cross-grained and more positiver like than a mule and his deafness made him worse in this because he never heard what nobody said but would say on his own way he was very odd but not cracked no he was as clear-headed when he took a thing the right way as any man could be and as clever and could talk as well as any member of parliament and good-natured and kind-hearted where he would take a fancy but then maybe it would be to a dog he was remarkable fond of dogs or a cat or a rat even that he would take a fancy and think more of them than he would of a christian 
but poor gentleman there's great allowance said she to be made for him that lost his son and heir that would have been heir to all and a fine youth that he doted upon but continued the old woman in whose mind the transitions from great to little from serious to trivial were ludicrously abrupt that was no reason why the old gentleman should scold me last time he was here as he did for as long as ever he could stand over me only because i killed a mouse who was eating my cheese and before night he beat a boy for stealing a piece of that same cheese and he would never when down here let me set a mouse trap well my good woman interrupted lord colambre who was little interested in this affair of the mouse-trap and nowise curious to learn more of mr reynolds's domestic economy i'll not trouble you any farther if you can be so good as to tell me the road to toddrington or to little wickham i think you call it little wickham repeated the woman laughing bless you sir where do you come from it's little restham surely everybody knows near lantry and keep the pike till you come to the turn at rotherford and then you strike off into the by-road to the left and then again turn at the ford to the right but if you are going to toddrington you don't go the road to market which is at the first turn to the left and the cross-country road where there's no quarter and toddrington lies but for restham you take the road to market it was some time before our hero could persuade the old woman to stick to little restham or to toddrington and not to mix the directions for the different roads together he took patience for his impatience only confused his director the more in process of time he made out and wrote down the various turns that he was to follow to reach little restham but no human power could get her from little restham to toddrington though she knew the road perfectly well but she had for the seventeen last years been used to go the other road and all the carriers went that way and passed the door and that was all she could certify little restham after turning to the left and right as often as his directory required our hero happily reached but unhappily he found no mr reynolds there only a steward who gave nearly the same account of his master as had been given by the old woman and could not guess even where the gentleman might now be toddrington was as likely as any place but he could not say perseverance against fortune to toddrington our hero proceeded through cross-country roads such roads very different from the irish roads wagon ruts into which the carriage wheels sunk nearly to the nave and from time to time sloughs of despond through which it seemed impossible to drag walk wade or swim and all the time with a sulky postillion oh how unlike my larry thought lord colambre at length in a very narrow lane going up a hill said to be two miles of descent they overtook a heavy laden wagon and they were obliged to go step by step behind it whilst enjoying the gentleman's impatience much and the postillion's sulkiness more the wagoner in his embroidered frock walked in state with his long sceptre in his hand the postillion muttered curses not loud but deep deep or loud no purpose would they have answered the wagoner's temper was proof against curse in or out of the english language and from their snail's pace neither dickens nor devil nor any postillion in england could make him put his horses lord colambre jumped out of the chaise and walking beside him began to talk to him and spoke of his horses their bells their trappings the beauty and strength of the thill horse the value of the whole team which his lordship happening to guess right within ten pounds and showing moreover some skill about road-making and wagon-wheels and being fortunately of the wagoner's own opinion in the great question about conical and cylindrical rims he was pleased with the young chap of a gentleman and in spite of the chuffiness of his appearance and churlishness of his speech this wagoner's bosom being made of penetrating stuff he determined to let the gentleman pass accordingly when half-way up the hill and the head of the four-horse came near an open gate 
the wagoner without saying one word or turning his head touched the horse with his long whip and the horse turned in at the gate and then came dobbin geeho and strange calls and sounds which all the other horses of the team obeyed and the wagon turned into the farmyard now master while i turn you may pass the covering of the wagon caught in the hedge as the wagon turned in and as the sacking was drawn back some of the packages were disturbed a cheese was just rolling off on the side next lord colambre he stopped it from falling the direction caught his quick eye to ralph reynolds esq todrington scratched out red lion square london written in another hand below now i have found him and surely i know that hand said lord colambre to himself looking more closely at the direction the original direction was certainly in a handwriting well known to him it was lady dashfort's that there cheese that you're looking at so curiously said the wagoner has been a great traveller for it came all the way down from lunnon and now it's going all the way up again back on account of not finding the gentleman at home and the man that booked it told me as how it came from foreign parts lord colambre took down the direction tossed the honest wagoner a guinea wished him good-night passed and went on as soon as he could he turned into the london road at the first town got a place in the mail reached london saw his father went directly to his friend count o'halloran who was delighted when he beheld the packet lord colambre was extremely eager to go immediately to old reynolds fatigued as he was for he had travelled night and day and had scarcely allowed himself mind or body one moment's repose heroes must sleep and lovers too or they soon will cease to be heroes or lovers said the count rest rest perturbed spirit this night and to-morrow morning we'll finish the adventure in red lion square or i will accompany you when and where you will if necessary to earth's remotest bounds the next morning lord colambre went to breakfast with the count the count who was not in love was not up for our hero was half an hour earlier than the time appointed the old servant ulick who had attended his master to england was very glad to see lord colambre again and showing him into the breakfast parlour could not help saying in defence of his master's punctuality your clocks i suppose my lord are half an hour faster than ours my master will be ready to the moment the count soon appeared breakfast was soon over and the carriage at the door for the count sympathized in his young friend's impatience as they were setting out the count's large irish dog pushed out of the house-door to follow them and his master would have forbidden him but lord colambre begged that he might be permitted to accompany them for his lordship recollected the old woman's having mentioned that mr reynolds was fond of dogs they arrived in red lion square found the house of mr reynolds and contrary to the count's prognostics found the old gentleman up and they saw him in his red nightcap at his parlour window after some minutes running backwards and forwards of a boy in the passage and two or three peeps taken over the blinds by the old gentleman they were admitted the boy could not master their names so they were obliged reciprocally to announce themselves count o'halloran and lord colambre the names seemed to make no impression on the old gentleman but he deliberately looked at the count and his lordship as if studying what rather than who they were in spite of the red nightcap and a flowered dressing-gown mr reynolds looked like a gentleman an odd gentleman but still a gentleman as count o'halloran came into the room and as his large dog attempted to follow the count's look expressed say shall i let him in or shut the door oh let him in by all means sir if you please i am fond of dogs and a finer one i never saw pray gentlemen be seated 
said he a portion of the complacency inspired by the sight of the dog diffusing itself over his manner towards the master of so fine an animal and even extending to the master's companion though in an inferior degree whilst mr reynolds stroked the dog the count told him that the dog was of a curious breed now almost extinct the irish greyhound of which only one nobleman in ireland it is said has now a few of the species remaining in his possession now lie down hannibal said the count mr reynolds we have taken the liberty though strangers of waiting upon you i beg your pardon sir interrupted mr reynolds but did i understand you rightly that a few of the same species are still to be had from one nobleman in ireland pray what is his name said he taking out his pencil the count wrote the name for him but observed that he had asserted only that a few of these dogs remained in the possession of that nobleman he could not answer for it that they were to be had oh i have ways and means said old reynolds and wrapping his snuff-box and talking as it was his custom loud to himself lady dashfort knows all those irish lords she shall get one for me ay ay count o'halloran replied as if the words had been addressed to him lady dashfort is in england i know it sir she is in london said mr reynolds hastily what do you know of her i know sir that she is not likely to return to ireland and that i am and so is my young friend here and if the thing can be accomplished we will get it done for you lord colambre joined in this promise and added that if the dog could be obtained he would undertake to have him safely sent over to england sir gentlemen i'm much obliged that is when you have done the thing i shall be much obliged but maybe you are only making me civil speeches of that sir said the count smiling with much temper your own sagacity and knowledge of the world must enable you to judge for my own part i can only say cried lord colambre that i am not in the habit of being reproached with saying one thing and meaning another hot i see said old reynolds nodding as he looked at lord colambre cool added he nodding at the count but a time for everything i was hot once both answers good for their ages this speech lord colambre and the count tacitly agreed to consider as another apart which they were not to hear or seem to hear the count began again on the business of their visit as he saw that lord colambre was boiling with impatience and feared that he should boil over and spoil all the count commenced with mr reynolds your name sounds to me like the name of a friend for i had once a friend of that name i had once the pleasure and a very great pleasure it was to me to be intimately acquainted abroad on the continent with a very amiable and gallant youth your son take care sir said the old man starting up from his chair and instantly sinking down again take care don't mention him to me unless you would strike me dead on the spot the convulsed motions of his fingers and face worked for some moments whilst the count and lord colambre much shocked and alarmed stood in silence the convulsed motions ceased and the old man unbuttoned his waistcoat as if to relieve some sense of oppression uncovered his grey hairs and after leaning back to rest himself with his eyes fixed and in reverie for a few moments he sat upright again in his chair and exclaimed as he looked round son did not somebody say that word who is so cruel to say that word before me nobody has ever spoken of him to me but once since his death do you know sir said he fixing his eyes on count o'halloran and laying his cold hand on him do you know where he was buried i ask you sir do you remember how he died too well too well cried the count so much affected as to be scarcely able to pronounce the words he died in my arms i buried him myself 
impossible cried mr reynolds why do you say so sir said he studying the count's face with a sort of bewildered earnestness impossible his body was sent over to me in a lead coffin and i saw it and i was asked and i answered in the family vault but the shock is over said he and gentlemen if the business of your visit relates to that subject i trust i am now sufficiently composed to attend to you indeed i ought to be prepared for i had reason for years to expect the stroke and yet when it came it seemed sudden it stunned me put an end to all my worldly prospects left me childless without a single descendant or relation near enough to be dear to me i am an insulated being no sir you are not an insulated being said lord colambre you have a near relation who will who must be dear to you who will make you amends for all you have lost all you have suffered who will bring peace and joy to your heart you have a granddaughter no sir i have no granddaughter said old reynolds his face and whole form becoming rigid with the expression of obstinacy rather have no descendant than be forced to acknowledge an illegitimate child my lord i entreat as a friend i command you to be patient said the count who saw lord colambre's indignation suddenly rise so then this is the purpose of your visit continued old reynolds and you come from my enemies from the st omars and you are in a league with them continued old reynolds and all this time it is of my eldest son you have been talking yes sir replied the count of captain reynolds who fell in battle in the austrian service about nineteen years ago a more gallant and amiable youth never lived pleasure revived through the dull look of obstinacy in the father's eyes he was as you say sir a gallant an amiable youth once and he was my pride and i loved him too once but did not you know i had another no sir we did not we are you may perceive totally ignorant of your family and of your affairs we have no connection whatever or knowledge of any of the st omars i detest the sound of the name cried lord colambre oh good good well well i beg your pardon gentlemen a thousand times i am a hasty very hasty old man but i have been harassed persecuted hunted by wretches who got a scent of my gold often in my rage i longed to throw my treasure-bags to my pursuers and bid them leave me to die in peace you have feelings i see both of you gentlemen excuse me and bear with my temper bear with you much enforced the best tempers will emit a hasty spark said the count looking at lord colambre who was now cool again and who with a countenance full of compassion sat with his eyes fixed upon the poor no not the poor but the unhappy old man yes i had another son continued mr reynolds and on him all my affections concentrated when i lost my eldest and for him i desired to preserve the estate which his mother brought into my family since you know nothing of my affairs let me explain to you that estate was so settled that it would have gone to the child even the daughter of my eldest son if there had been a legitimate child but i knew there was no marriage and i held out firm to my opinion if there was a marriage said i show me the marriage certificate and i will acknowledge the marriage and acknowledge the child but they could not and i knew they could not and i kept the estate for my darling boy cried the old gentleman with the exultation of successful positiveness again appearing strong in his physiognomy but suddenly changing and relaxing his countenance fell and he added but now i have no darling boy what use all all must go to the heir at law 
or i must will it to a stranger a lady of quality who has just found out she is my relation god knows how i'm no genealogist and sends me irish cheese and iceland moss for my breakfast and her waiting gentlewoman to namby pamby me oh i'm sick of it all see through it wish i was blind wish i had a hiding-place where flatterers could not find me pursued chased must change my lodgings again to-morrow will will i beg your pardon gentlemen again you were going to tell me sir something more of my eldest son and how i was led away from the subject i don't know but i meant only to have assured you that his memory was dear to me till i was so tormented about that unfortunate affair of his pretended marriage that at length i hated to hear him named but the heir at law at last will triumph over me no my good sir not if you triumph over yourself and do justice cried lord colambre if you listen to the truth which my friend will tell you and if you will read and believe the confirmation of it under your son's own hand in this packet his own hand indeed his seal unbroken but how when where why was it kept so long and how came it into your hands count o'halloran told mr reynolds that the packet had been given to him by captain reynolds on his deathbed related the dying acknowledgment which captain reynolds had made of his marriage and gave an account of the delivery of the packet to the ambassador who had promised to transmit it faithfully lord colambre told the manner in which it had been mislaid and at last recovered from among the deceased ambassador's papers the father still gazed at the direction and re-examined the seals my son's handwriting my son's seals but where is the certificate of the marriage repeated he if it is within sight of this packet i have done great in but i am convinced it never was a marriage yet i wish now it could be proved only in that case i have for years done great won't you open the packet sir said lord colambre mr reynolds looked up at him with a look that said i don't clearly know what interest you have in all this but unable to speak and his hands trembling so that he could scarcely break the seals he tore off the cover laid the papers before him sat down and took breath lord colambre however impatient had now too much humanity to hurry the old gentleman he only ran for the spectacles which he espied on the chimney-piece rubbed them bright and held them ready mr reynolds stretched his hand out for them put them on and the first paper he opened was the certificate of the marriage he read it aloud and putting it down said now i acknowledge the marriage i always said if there is a marriage there must be a certificate and you see now there is a certificate i acknowledge the marriage and now cried lord colambre i am happy positively happy acknowledge your granddaughter sir acknowledge miss nugent acknowledge who sir acknowledge miss reynolds your granddaughter i ask no more do what you will with your fortune oh now i understand i begin to understand this young gentleman is in love but where is my granddaughter how shall i know she is my granddaughter i have not heard of her since she was an infant i forgot her existence i have done her great injustice she knows nothing of it sir said lord colambre who now entered into a full explanation of miss nugent's history and of her connection with his family and of his own attachment to her concluding the whole by assuring mr reynolds that his granddaughter had every virtue under heaven and as to your fortune sir i know that she will as i do say no matter what she will say interrupted old reynolds where is she when i see her i shall hear what she says 
tell me where she is let me see her i long to see whether there is any likeness to her poor father where is she let me see her immediately she is one hundred and sixty miles off sir at buxton well my lord and what is a hundred and sixty miles i suppose you think i can't stir from my chair but you are mistaken i think nothing of a journey of a hundred and sixty miles i'm ready to set off to-morrow this instant lord colambre said that he was sure miss reynolds would obey her grandfather's slightest summons as it was her duty to do and would be with him as soon as possible if this would be more agreeable to him i will write to her instantly said his lordship if you will commission me no my lord i do not commission i will go i think nothing i say of a journey of a hundred and sixty miles i'll go and set out to-morrow morning lord colambre and the count perfectly satisfied with the result of their visit now thought it best to leave old reynolds at liberty to rest himself after so many strong and varied feelings they paid their parting compliments settled the time for the next day's journey and were just going to quit the room when lord colambre heard in the passage a well-known voice the voice of mrs petito oh no my compliments and my lady dashfort's best compliments and i will call again no no cried old reynolds pulling his bell i'll have no calling again i'll be hanged if i do let her in now and i'll see her jack let in that woman now or never the lady's gone sir out of the street door after her then now or never tell her sir she was in a hackney coach old reynolds jumped up and went to the window himself and seeing the hackney coachman just turning beckoned at the window and mrs petito was set down again and ushered in by jack who announced her as the lady sir the only lady he had seen in that house my dear mr reynolds i'm so obliged to you for letting me in cried mrs petito adjusting her shawl in the passage and speaking in a voice and manner well mimicked after her betters you are so very good and kind and i am so much obliged to you you are not obliged to me and i am neither good nor kind said old reynolds you strange man said mrs petito advancing gracefully in shawl drapery but she stopped short my lord colambre and count o'halloran as i hope to be saved i did not know mrs petito was an acquaintance of yours gentlemen said mr reynolds smiling shrewdly count o'halloran was too polite to deny his acquaintance with a lady who challenged it by thus naming him but he had not the slightest recollection of her though it seems he had met her on the stairs when he visited lady dashfort at kilpatrick's town lord colambre was indeed undeniably an old acquaintance and as soon as she had recovered from her first natural start and vulgar exclamation she with very easy familiarity hoped my lady clonbrony and my lord and miss nugent and all her friends in the family were well and said she did not know whether she was to congratulate his lordship or not upon miss broadhurst my lady beryl's marriage but she should soon have to hope for his lordship's congratulations for another marriage in her present family lady isabel to colonel heathcock who has come in for a large portion and they are buying the wedding clothes sights of clothes and the diamonds this day and lady dashfort and my lady isabel sent me especially sir to you mr reynolds and to tell you sir before anybody else and to hope the cheese come safe up again at last and to ask whether the iceland moss agrees with your chocolate and is palatable it's the most diluent thing upon the universal earth and the most tonic and fashionable the duchess of torcaster takes it always for breakfast and lady st james too is quite a convert and i hear the duke of v takes it too and the devil may take it too for anything that i care said old reynolds oh my dear dear sir you are so refractory a patient i am no patient at all ma'am and have no patience either 
i am as well as you are or my lady dashfort either and hope god willing long to continue so mrs petito smiled aside at lord colambre to mark her perception of the man's strangeness then in a cajoling voice addressing herself to the old gentleman long long i hope to continue so if heaven grants my daily and nightly prayers and my lady dashfort's also so mr reynolds if the lady's prayers are of any avail you ought to be purely and i suppose ladies prayers have the precedency in efficacy but it was not of prayers and deathbed affairs i came commissioned to treat not of burials which heaven above forbid but of weddings my diplomacy was to speak and to premise my lady dashfort would have come herself in her carriage but is hurried out of her senses and my lady isabel could not in proper modesty so they sent me as their double to hope you my dear mr reynolds who is one of the family relations will honour the wedding with your presence it would be no honour and they know that as well as i do said the intractable mr reynolds it will be no advantage either but that they do not know as well as i do mrs petito to save you and your lady all trouble about me in future please to let my lady dashfort know that i have just received and read the certificate of my son captain reynolds's marriage with miss st omar i have acknowledged the marriage better late than never and to-morrow morning god willing shall set out with this young nobleman for buxton where i hope to see and intend publicly to acknowledge my granddaughter provided she will acknowledge me criminy exclaimed mrs petito what new turns are here well sir i shall tell my lady of the metamorphoses that have taken place though by what magic as i have not the honour to deal in the black art i can't guess but since it seems annoying and inopportune i shall take my finale and shall thus have a verbal p p c as you are leaving town it seems for buxton so early in the morning my lord colambre if i see rightly into a millstone as i hope and believe i do on the present occasion i have to congratulate your lordship haven't i upon something like a succession or a windfall in this denouement and i beg you'll make my humble respects acceptable to the ci-devant miss grace nugent that was and i won't derogate her by any other name in the interregnum as i am persuaded it will only be a temporary name scarce worth assuming except for the honour of the public adoption and that will i'm confident be soon exchanged for a viscount's title or i have no sagacity nor sympathy i hope i don't pray don't let me put you to the blush my lord lord colambre would not have let her if he could have helped it count o'halloran your most obedient i had the honour of meeting you at kilpatrick's town said mrs petito backing to the door and twitching her shawl she stumbled nearly fell down over the large dog caught by the door and recovered herself hannibal rose and shook his ears poor fellow you are of my acquaintance too she would have stroked his head but hannibal walked off indignant and so did she thus ended certain hopes for mrs petito had conceived that her diplomacy might be turned to account that in her character of an ambassadress as lady dashfort's double by the aid of iceland moss in chocolate flattery properly administered that by bearing with all her dear mr reynolds's oddnesses and roughnesses she might in time that is to say before he made a new will become his dear mrs petito or for stranger things have happened and do happen every day his dear mrs reynolds mrs petito however was good at a retreat and she flattered herself that at least nothing of this underplot had appeared and at all events she secured by her services in this embassy the long-looked-for object of her ambition lady dashfort's scarlet velvet gown not yet a thread the worse for the wear one cordial look at this 
comforted her for the loss of her expected octogenaire and she proceeded to discomfit her lady by repeating the message with which strange old mr reynolds had charged her so ended all lady dashfort's hopes of his fortune since the death of his youngest son she had been indefatigable in her attentions and sanguine in her hopes the disappointment affected both her interest and her pride as an intrigant it was necessary however to keep her feelings to herself for if heathcock should hear anything of the matter before the articles were signed he might be off so she put him and lady isabel into her coach directly drove to gray's to make sure at all events of the jewels in the meantime count o'halloran and lord colambre delighted with the result of their visit took leave of mr reynolds after having arranged the journey and appointed the hour for setting off the next day lord colambre proposed to call upon mr reynolds in the evening and introduce his father lord clonbrony but mr reynolds said no no i'm not ceremonious i have given you proofs enough of that i think in the short time we've been already acquainted time enough to introduce your father to me when we are in a carriage going our journey then we can talk and get acquainted but merely to come this evening in a hurry and say lord clonbrony mr reynolds mr reynolds lord clonbrony and then bob our two heads at one another and scrape one foot back and away where's the use of that nonsense at my time of life or at any time of life no no we have enough to do without that i dare say good morning to you count o'halloran i thank you heartily from the first moment i saw you i liked you lucky too that you brought your dog with you twas hannibal made me first let you in i saw him over the top of the blind hannibal my good fellow i'm more obliged to you than you can guess so are we all said lord colambre hannibal was well patted and then they parted in returning home they met sir james brooke i told you said sir james i should be in london almost as soon as you have you found old reynolds just come from him how does your business prosper i hope as well as mine a history of all that had passed up to the present moment was given and hearty congratulations received where are you going now sir james cannot you come with us said lord colambre and the count impossible replied sir james but perhaps you can come with me i'm going to gray's to give some old family diamonds either to be new set or exchanged count o'halloran i know you are a judge of these things pray come and give me your opinion better consult your bride elect said the count no she knows little of the matter and cares less replied sir james not so this bride elect or i mistake her much said the count as they passed by the window and saw lady isabel who with lady dashfort had been holding consultation deep with the jeweller and heathcock playing personage muet lady dashfort who had always as old reynolds expressed it her head upon her shoulders presence of mind where her interests were concerned ran to the door before the count and lord colambre could enter giving a hand to each as if they had all parted the best friends in the world how do how do give you joy give me joy and all that but mind not a word said she laying her finger upon her lips not a word before heathcock of old reynolds or of the best part of the old fool his fortune the gentleman bowed in sign of submission to her ladyship's commands and comprehended that she feared heathcock might be off if the best part of his bride her fortune or her expectations were lowered in value or in prospect how low is she reduced whispered lord colambre when such a husband is thought a prize and to be secured by a manoeuvre he sighed spare that generous sigh said sir james brooke it is wasted lady isabel as they approached turned from a mirror at which she was trying on a diamond crescent 
her face clouded at sight of count o'halloran and lord colambre and grew dark as hatred when she saw sir james brooke she walked away to the farther end of the shop and asked one of the shopmen the price of a diamond necklace which lay upon the counter the man said he really did not know it belonged to lady oranmore it had just been new set for one of her ladyship's daughters who is going to be married to sir james brooke one of the gentlemen my lady who are just come in then calling to his master he asked him the price of the necklace he named the value which was considerable i really thought lady oranmore and her daughters were vastly too philosophical to think of diamonds said lady isabel to her mother with a sort of sentimental sneer in her voice and countenance but it is some comfort to me to find in these pattern women philosophy and love do not so wholly engross the heart that they feel every vanity in fondness lost twould be difficult in some cases thought many present pon honour diamonds are cursed expensive things i know said heathcock but be that as it may whispered he to the lady though loud enough to be heard by others i've laid a damned round wager that no woman's diamonds married this winter under a countess in london shall eclipse lady isabel heathcock's and mr gray here's to be judge lady isabel paid for this promise one of her sweetest smiles with one of those smiles which she had formerly bestowed upon lord colambre and which he had once fancied expressed so much sensibility such discriminative and delicate application our hero felt so much contempt that he never wasted another sigh of pity for her degradation lady dashfort came up to him as he was standing alone and whilst the count and sir james were settling about the diamonds my lord colambre said she in a low voice i know your thoughts and i could moralize as well as you if i did not prefer laughing you are right enough and so am i and so is isabel we are all right for look here women have not always the liberty of choice and therefore they can't be expected to have always the power of refusal the mother satisfied with her convenient optimism got into her carriage with her daughter her daughter's diamonds and her precious son-in-law her daughter's companion for life the more i see said count o'halloran to lord colambre as they left the shop the more i find reason to congratulate you upon your escape my dear lord i owe it not to my own wit or wisdom said lord colambre but much to love and much to friendship added he turning to sir james brooke here was the friend who early warned me against the siren's voice who before i knew lady isabel told me what i have since found to be true that two passions alternately govern her fate her business is love but her pleasure is hate that is dreadfully severe sir james said count o'halloran but i am afraid it is just i am sure it is just or i would not have said it replied sir james brooke for the foibles of the sex i hope i have as much indulgence as any man and for the errors of passion as much pity but i cannot repress the indignation the abhorrence i feel against women cold and vain who use their wit and their charms only to make others miserable lord colambre recollected at this moment lady isabel's look and voice when she declared that she would let her little finger be cut off to purchase the pleasure of inflicting on lady de cressy for one hour the torture of jealousy perhaps continued sir james brooke now that i am going to marry into an irish family i may feel with peculiar energy disapprobation of this mother and daughter on another account but you lord colambre will do me the justice to recollect that before i had any personal interest in the country i expressed as a general friend to ireland antipathy to those who returned the hospitality they received from a warm-hearted people 
by publicly setting the example of elegant sentimental hypocrisy or daring disregard of decorum by privately endeavouring to destroy the domestic peace of families on which at last public as well as private virtue and happiness depend i do rejoice my dear colambre to hear you say that i had any share in saving you from the siren and now i will never speak of these ladies more i am sorry you cannot stay in town to see but why should i be sorry we shall meet again i trust and i shall introduce you and you i hope will introduce me to a very different charmer farewell you have my warm good wishes wherever you go sir james turned off quickly to the street in which lady oranmore lived and lord colambre had not time to tell him that he knew and admired his intended bride count o'halloran promised to do this for him and now said the good count i am to take leave of you and i assure you i do it with so much reluctance that nothing less than positive engagements to stay in town would prevent me from setting off with you to-morrow but i shall be soon very soon at liberty to return to ireland and clonbrony castle if you will give me leave i will see before i see halloran castle lord colambre joyfully thanked his friend for this promise nay it is to indulge myself i long to see you happy long to behold the choice of such a heart as yours pray do not steal a march upon me let me know in time i will leave everything even the siege of for your wedding but i trust i shall be in time assuredly you will my dear count if ever that wedding if repeated the count if repeated lord colambre obstacles which when we last parted appeared to me invincible prevented my having ever even attempted to make an impression on the heart of the woman i love and if you knew her count as well as i do you would know that her love could not unsought be won of that i cannot doubt or she would not be your choice but when her love is sought we have every reason to hope said the count smiling that it may because it ought to be won by troyed honour and affection i only require to be left in hope well i leave you hope said lord colambre miss nugent miss reynolds i should say has been in the habit of considering a union with me as impossible my mother early instilled this idea into her mind miss nugent thought that duty forbade her to think of me she told me so i have seen it in all her conduct and manners the barriers of habit the ideas of duty cannot ought not to be thrown down or suddenly changed in a well-regulated female mind and you i am sure know enough of the best female hearts to be aware that time well well let this dear good charmer take her own time provided there's none given to affectation or prudery or coquetry and from all these of course she must be free and of course i must be content adieu au revoir End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the absentee by maria edgeworth this librivox recording is in the public domain as lord colambre was returning home he was overtaken by sir terence o'fay well my lord cried sir terence out of breath you have led me a pretty dance all over the town here's a letter somewhere down in my safe pocket for you which has cost me trouble enough Phew, where is it now it's from miss nugent said he holding up the letter the direction to grosvenor square london had been scratched out and it had been redirected by sir terence to the lord viscount colambre at sir james brooks baronet brookwood huntingdonshire or elsewhere with speed but the more haste the worse speed for away it went to brookwood huntingdonshire 
where i knew if anywhere you was to be found but as fate and the post would have it there the letter went coursin after you while you were runnin round and back and forwards and everywhere i understand to toddrington and restham and where not through all them english places where there's no cross post so i took it for granted that it found its way to the dead letter office or was stickin up across a pane in the damned postmaster's window at huntingdon for the whole town to see and it a love letter and some puppy to claim it under false pretence and you all the time without it and it might breed a coolness betwixt you and miss nugent but my dear sir terence give me the letter now you have me oh my dear lord if you knew what a race i have had missin you here by five minutes and there by five seconds but i have you at last and you have it and i'm paid this minute for all i liquidated of my substance by the pleasure i have in seeing you crack the seal and read it but take care you don't tumble over the orange woman orange barrows are a great nuisance when one's studying a letter in the streets of london or the metropolis but never heed stick to my arm and i'll guide you like a blind man safe through the thick of them miss nugent's letter which lord clamber read in spite of the jostling of passengers and the incessant talking of sir terence was as follows let me not be the cause of banishing you from your home and your country where you would do so much good and make so many happy let me not be the cause of your breaking your promise to your mother of your disappointing my dear aunt so cruelly who has complied with all our wishes and who sacrifices to oblige us her favourite tastes how could she ever be happy in ireland how could clonbrony castle be a home to her without her son if you take away all she had of amusement and pleasure as it is called are not you bound to give her in their stead that domestic happiness which she can enjoy only with you and by your means if instead of living with her you go into the army she will be in daily nightly anxiety and alarm about you and her son will instead of being a comfort be a source of torment to her i will hope that you will do now as you have always hitherto done on every occasion where i have seen you act what is right and just and kind come here on the day you promised my aunt you would before that time i shall be in cambridgeshire with my friend lady beryl she is so good as to come to buxton for me i shall remain with her instead of returning to ireland i have explained my reasons to my dear aunt could i have any concealment from her to whom from my earliest childhood i owe everything that kindness and affection could give she is satisfied she consents to my living henceforward with lady beryl let me have the pleasure of seeing by your conduct that you approve of mine your affectionate cousin and friend grace nugent this letter as may be imagined by those who like him are capable of feeling honourable and generous conduct gave our hero exquisite pleasure poor good-natured sir terence o'fay enjoyed his lordship's delight and forgot himself so completely that he never even inquired whether lord colambre had thought of an affair on which he had spoken to him some time before and which materially concerned sir terence's interest the next morning when the carriage was at the door and sir terence was just taking leave of his friend lord clonbrony and actually in tears wishing them all manner of happiness though he said there was none left now in london or the wide world even for him lord colambre went up to him and said sir terence you have never inquired whether i have done your business oh my dear i'm not thinking of that now time enough by the post i can write after you but my thoughts won't turn for me to business now no matter your business is done replied lord colambre then i wonder how you could think of it with all you had upon your mind and heart when anything's upon my heart good morning to my head it's not worth a lemon good-bye to you and thank you kindly and all happiness attend you good-bye to you sir terence o'fay said lord clonbrony and since it's so ordered i must live without you 
oh you'll live better without me my lord i am not a good liver i know nor the best of all companions for a nobleman young or old and now you'll be rich and not put to your shifts and your wits what would i have to do for you sir terence o'fay you know was only the poor nobleman's friend and you'll never want to call upon him again thanks to your jewel your pitt's diamond of a son there so we part here and depend upon it you're better without me that's all my comfort or my heart would break the carriage is waitin this long time and this young lover's itchin to be off god bless you both that's my last word they called in red lion square punctual to the moment on old mr reynolds but his window shutters were shut he had been seized in the night with a violent fit of the gout which as he said held him fast by the leg but here said he giving lord colambre a letter here's what will do your business without me take this written acknowledgment i have penned for you and give my granddaughter her father's letter to read it would touch a heart of stone touched mine wish i could drag the mother back out of her grave to do her justice all one now you see at last i'm not a suspicious rascal however for i don't suspect you of palming a false granddaughter upon me will you said lord colambre give your granddaughter leave to come up to town to you sir you would satisfy yourself at least as to what resemblance she may bear to her father miss reynolds will come instantly and she will nurse you no no i won't have her come if she comes i won't see her shan't begin by nursing me not selfish as soon as i get rid of this gout i shall be my own man and young again and i'll soon be after you across the sea that shan't stop me i'll come to what's the name of your place in ireland and see what likeness i can find to her poor father in this granddaughter of mine that you puffed so finely yesterday and let me see whether she will wheedle me as finely as mrs petito would don't get ready your marriage settlements do you hear till you have seen my will which i shall sign at what's the name of your place write it down there there's pen and ink and leave me for the twinge is coming and i shall roar will you permit me sir to leave my own servant with you to take care of you i can answer for his attention and fidelity let me see his face and i'll tell you lord colambre's servant was summoned yes i like his face god bless you leave me lord colambre gave his servant a charge to bear with mr reynolds's rough manner and temper and to pay the poor old gentleman every possible attention then our hero proceeded with his father on his journey and on this journey nothing happened worthy of note on his first perusal of the letter from grace lord colambre had feared that she would have left buxton with lady beryl before he could reach it but upon recollection he hoped that the few lines he had written addressed to his mother and miss nugent with the assurance that he should be with them on wednesday would be sufficient to show her that some great change had happened and consequently sufficient to prevent her from quitting her aunt till she could know whether such a separation would be necessary he argued wisely more wisely than grace had reasoned for notwithstanding this note she would have left buxton before his arrival but for lady beryl's strength of mind and positive determination not to set out with her till lord colambre should arrive to explain in the interval poor grace was indeed in an anxious state of suspense and her uncertainty whether she was doing right or wrong by staying to see lord colambre tormented her most my dear you cannot help yourself be quiet said lady beryl i will take the whole upon my conscience and i hope my conscience may never have anything worse to answer for grace was the first person who from her window saw lord colambre the instant the carriage drove to the door she ran to her friend lady beryl's apartment he is come now take me away not yet my sweet friend lie down upon this sofa if you please and keep yourself tranquil 
whilst i go and see what you ought to do and depend upon me for a true friend in whose mind as in your own duty is the first object i depend on you entirely said grace sinking down on the sofa and you see i obey you many thanks to you for lying down when you can't stand lady beryl went to lady clonbrony's apartment she was met by sir arthur come my love come quick lord colambre is arrived i know it and does he go to ireland speak instantly that i may tell grace nugent you can tell her nothing yet my love for we know nothing lord colambre will not say a word till you come but i know by his countenance that he has good and extraordinary news they passed rapidly along the passage to lady clonbrony's room oh my dear dear lady beryl come or i shall die with impatience cried lady clonbrony in a voice and manner between laughing and crying there now you have congratulated are very happy and very glad and all that now for mercy's sake sit down lord clonbrony for heaven's sake sit down beside me here or anywhere now colambre begin and tell us all at once but as nothing is so tedious as a twice-told tale lord colambre's narrative need not here be repeated he began with count o'halloran's visit immediately after lady clonbrony had left london and went through the history of the discovery that captain reynolds was the husband of miss st omar and the father of grace the dying acknowledgment of his marriage the packet delivered by count o'halloran to the careless ambassador how recovered by the assistance of his executor sir james brooke the travels from restham to todrington and thence to red lion square the interview with old reynolds and its final result all was related as succinctly as the impatient curiosity of lord colambre's auditors could desire oh wonder upon wonder and joy upon joy cried lady clonbrony so my darling grace is as legitimate as i am and an heiress after all where is she where is she in your room lady beryl oh colambre why wouldn't you let her be by lady beryl do you know he would not let me send for her though she was the person of all others most concerned for that very reason ma'am and that lord colambre was quite right i am sure you must be sensible when you recollect that grace has no idea that she is not the daughter of mr nugent she has no suspicion that the breath of blame ever lighted upon her mother this part of the story cannot be announced to her with too much caution and indeed her mind has been so much harassed and agitated and she is at present so far from strong that great delicacy true very true lady beryl interrupted lady clonbrony and i'll be as delicate as you please about it afterwards but in the first and foremost place i must tell her the best part of the story that she's an heiress madam that never killed anybody so darting through all opposition lady clonbrony made her way into the room where grace was lying yes get up get up my own grace and be surprised well you may you are an heiress after all am i my dear aunt said grace true as i'm lady clonbrony and a very great heiress and no more colambre's cousin than lady beryl here so now begin and love him as fast as you please i give my consent and here he is lady clonbrony turned to her son who just appeared at the door oh mother what have you done what have i done cried lady clonbrony following her son's eyes lord bless me grace fainted dead lady beryl oh what have i done my dear lady beryl what shall we do there her colour's coming again said lord clonbrony come away my dear lady clonbrony for the present and so will i though i long to talk to the darling girl myself but she is not equal to it yet when grace came to herself she first saw lady beryl leaning over her and raising herself a little she said what has happened i don't know yet i don't know whether i am happy or not 
then seeing lord colambre she sat quite upright you received my letter cousin i hope do you go to ireland with my aunt yes and with you i hope my beloved friend said colambre you once assured me that i had such a share of your esteem and affection that the idea of my accompanying you to ireland was not disagreeable to you you flattered me that i formed part of your agreeable associations with home yes sit down by me won't you my dear lady beryl but then i considered you as my cousin lord colambre and i thought you felt the same towards me but now but now my charming grace said lord colambre kneeling beside her and taking her hand no invincible obstacle opposes my passion no invincible obstacle did i say let me hope that i may say no obstacle but what depends on the change in the nature of your sentiments you heard my mother's consent you saw her joy i scarcely knew what i heard or saw said grace blushing deeply or what i now see and hear but of this i feel secure before i comprehend the mystery before you explain to me the causes of your change of conduct that you have never been actuated by caprice but governed by wise and honourable motives as to my going to ireland or remaining with lady beryl she has heard all the circumstances she is my friend and yours a better friend cannot be to her i appeal she will decide for me what i ought to do she promised to take me from hence instantly if i ought to go i did and i would do so without hesitation if any duty or any prudence required it but after having heard all the circumstances i can only tell you that i willingly resign the pleasure of your company but tell her my dear lady beryl said lord colambre excellent friend as you are explain to her you can better than any of us all that is to be known let her know my whole conduct and then let her decide for herself and i shall submit to her decision it is difficult my dear grace to restrain the expression of love of passion such as i feel but i have some power over myself you know it and this i can promise you that your affections shall be free as air that no wishes of friends no interference nothing but your own unbiased choice will i allow if my life depended upon it to operate in my favour be assured my dearest grace added he smiling as he retired you shall have time to know whether you are happy or not the moment he had left the room she threw herself into the arms of her friend and her heart oppressed with various feelings was relieved by tears a species of relief to which she was not habituated i am happy said she but what was the invincible obstacle what was the meaning of my aunt's words and what was the cause of her joy explain all this to me my dear friend for i am still as if i were in a dream with all the delicacy which lady clonbrony deemed superfluous lady beryl explained nothing could surpass the astonishment of grace on first learning that mr nugent was not her father when she was told of the stigma that had been cast on her birth the suspicions the disgrace to which her mother had been subjected for so many years that mother whom she had so loved and respected who had with such care instilled into the mind of her daughter the principles of virtue and religion that mother whom grace had always seen the example of every virtue she taught on whom her daughter never suspected that the touch of blame the breath of scandal could rest grace could express her sensations only by repeating in tones of astonishment pathos indignation my mother my mother my mother for some time she was incapable of attending to any other idea or of feeling any other sensations when her mind was able to admit the thought her friend soothed her by recalling the expressions of lord colambre's love 
the struggle by which he had been agitated when he fancied a union with her opposed by an invincible obstacle grace sighed and acknowledged that in prudence it ought to have been an invincible obstacle she admired the firmness of his decision the honour with which she had acted towards her one moment she exclaimed then if i had been the daughter of a mother who had conducted herself ill he never would have trusted me the next moment she recollected with pleasure the joy she had just seen in his eyes the affection the passion that spoke in every word and look then dwelt upon the sober certainty that all obstacles were removed and no duty opposes my loving him and my aunt wishes it my kind aunt and i may think of him you my best friend would not assure me of this if you were not certain of the truth oh how can i thank you for all your kindness and for that best of all kindness sympathy you see your calmness your strength of mind supports and tranquillizes me i would rather have heard all i have just learnt from you than from any other person living i could not have borne it from any one else no one else knows my mind so perfectly yet my aunt is very good and my dear uncle should not i go to him but he is not my uncle she is not my aunt i cannot bring myself to think that they are not my relations and that i am nothing to them you may be everything to them my dear grace said lady beryl whenever you please you may be their daughter grace blushed and smiled and sighed and was consoled but then she recollected her new relation mr reynolds her grandfather whom she had never seen who had for years disowned her treated her mother with injustice she could scarcely think of him with complacency yet when his age his sufferings his desolate state were represented she pitied him and faithful to her strong sense of duty would have gone instantly to offer him every assistance and attention in her power lady beryl assured her that mr reynolds had positively forbidden her going to him and that he had assured lord colambre he would not see her if she went to him after such rapid and varied emotions poor grace desired repose and her friend took care that it should be secured to her for the remainder of the day in the meantime lord clonbrony had kindly and judiciously employed his lady in a discussion about certain velvet furniture which grace had painted for the drawing-room at clonbrony castle in lady clonbrony's mind as in some bad paintings there was no keeping all objects great and small were upon the same level the moment her son entered the room her ladyship exclaimed everything pleasant at once here's your father tells me grace's velvet furniture's all packed really soho's the best man in the world of his kind and the cleverest and so after all my dear colambre as i always hoped and prophesied at last you will marry an heiress and terry said lord clonbrony will win his wager from mordecai terry repeated lady clonbrony that odious terry i hope my lord that he is not to be one of my comforts in ireland no my dear mother he is much better provided for than we could have expected one of my father's first objects was to prevent him from being any encumbrance to you we consulted him as to the means of making him happy and the knight acknowledged that he had long been casting a sheep's eye at a little snug place that will soon be open in his native country the chair of assistant barrister at the sessions assistant barrister said my father but my dear terry you have all your life been evading the laws and very frequently breaking the peace do you think this has qualified you peculiarly for being a guardian of the laws sir terence replied yes sure 
set a thief to catch a thief is no bad maxim and did not mr cohoon the scotchman get himself made a great justice by his making all the world as wise as himself about thieves of all sorts by land and by water and in the air too where he detected the mudlarks and is not barrington chief justice of botany bay my father now began to be seriously alarmed lest sir terence should insist upon his using his interest to make him an assistant barrister he was not aware that five years practice at the bar was a necessary accomplishment for this office when fortunately for all parties my good friend count o'halloran helped us out of the difficulty by starting an idea full of practical justice a literary friend of the count's had been for some time promised a lucrative situation under government but unfortunately he was a man of so much merit and ability that they could not find employment for him at home and they gave him a commission i should rather say a contract abroad for supplying the army with hungarian horses now the gentleman had not the slightest skill in horseflesh and as sir terence is a complete jockey the count observed that he would be the best possible deputy for his literary friend we warranted him to be a thorough-going friend and i do think the coalition will be well for both parties the count has settled it all and i left sir terence comfortably provided for out of your way my dear mother and as happy as he could be when parting from my father Lord Colambre was assiduous in engaging his mother's attention upon any subject which could for the present draw her thoughts away from her young friend but at every pause in the conversation her ladyship repeated so grace is an heiress after all so after all they know they are not cousins well i prefer grace a thousand times over to any other heiress in england no obstacle no objection they have my consent i always prophesied colambre would marry an heiress but why not marry directly her ardour and impatience to hurry things forward seemed now likely to retard the accomplishment of her own wishes and lord clonbrony who understood rather more of the passion of love than his lady ever had felt or understood saw the agony into which she threw her son and felt for his darling grace with a degree of delicacy and address of which few would have supposed lord clonbrony capable his lordship co-operated with his son in endeavours to keep lady clonbrony quiet and to suppress the hourly thanksgivings of grace's turning out an heiress on one point however she vowed she would not be overruled she would have a splendid wedding at clonbrony castle such as should become an heir and heiress and the wedding she hoped would be immediately on their return to ireland she should announce the thing to her friends directly on her arrival at clonbrony castle my dear said lord clonbrony we must wait in the first place the pleasure of old mr reynolds's fit of the gout why that's true because of his will said her ladyship but a will's soon made is not it that can't be much delay and then there must be settlements said lord clonbrony they take time lovers like all the rest of mankind must submit to the law's delay in the meantime my dear as these buxton baths agree with you so well and as grace does not seem to be over and above strong for travelling a long journey and as there are many curious and beautiful scenes of nature here in derbyshire matlock and the wonders of the peak and so on which the young people would be glad to see together and may not have another opportunity soon why not rest ourselves a little for another reason too continued his lordship bringing together as many arguments as he could for he had often found that though lady clonbrony was a match for any single argument her understanding could be easily overpowered by a number of whatever sort besides my dear here's sir arthur and lady beryl come to buxton on purpose to meet us and we owe them some compliment and something more than compliment i think 
so i don't see why we should be in a hurry to leave them or quit buxton a few weeks sooner or later can't signify and clonbrony castle will be getting all the while into better order for us burke is gone down there and if we stay here quietly there will be time for the velvet furniture to get there before us and to be unpacked and up in the drawing-room that's true my lord said lady clonbrony and there is a great deal of reason in all you say so i second that motion as colambre i see subscribes to it they stayed some time in derbyshire and every day lord clonbrony proposed some pleasant excursion and contrived that the young people should be left to themselves as mrs broadhurst used so strenuously to advise the recollection of whose authoritative maxims fortunately still operated upon lady clonbrony to the great ease and advantage of the lovers happy as a lover a friend a son happy in the consciousness of having restored a father to respectability and persuaded a mother to quit the feverish joys of fashion for the pleasures of domestic life happy in the hope of winning the whole heart of the woman he loved and whose esteem he knew he possessed and deserved happy in developing every day every hour fresh charms in his destined bride we leave our hero returning to his native country and we leave him with the reasonable expectation that he will support through life the promise of his early character that his patriotic views will extend with his power to carry wishes into action that his attachment to his warm-hearted countrymen will still increase upon further acquaintance and that he will long diffuse happiness through the wide circle which is peculiarly subject to the influence and example of a great resident irish proprietor letter from larry to his brother pat brady at mr mordecai's coachmaker london my dear brother yours of the twenty sixth enclosing the five pound note for my father came safe to hand monday last and with his thanks and blessing to you he commends it to you herewith enclosed back again on account of his being in no immediate necessity nor likelihood to want in future as you shall hear forthwith but wants you over with all speed and the note will answer for travelling charges for we can't enjoy the look it has pleased god to give us without yees put the rest in your pocket and read it when you've time old nick's gone and st dennis along with him to the place he come from praise be to god the old lord has found him out in his tricks and i helped him to that through the young lord that i driv as i informed you in my last when he was a welchman which was the best turn ever i did though i did not know it no more than adam that time so old nick's turned out of the agency clean and clear and the day after it was known there was surprise and great joy through the whole country not surprise in either but just what you might knowing him reasonably expect he that is old nick and st dennis would have been burnt that night i mean in effigy through the town of clonbrony but that the new man mr burke come down that day too soon to stop it and said it was not becoming to trample on the fallen or something that way that put an end to it and though it was a great disappointment to many and to me in particular i could not but like the gentleman the better for it anyhow they say he is a very good gentleman and as unlike old nick or the saint as can be and takes no duty foul nor glove nor seal in money nor asks duty work nor duty turf well when i was disappointed of the effigy i comforted myself by making a bonfire of old nick's big rick of duty turf which by great luck was out in the road away from all dwellin house or thatch or yards to take fire so no danger in life or objection and such another blaze i wished you'd seed it and all the men women and children in the town and country far and near gathered round it shoutin and dancin like mad and it was light as day quite across the bog as far as bartley finnegan's house and i heard after they seen it from all parts of the three counties and they thought it was st john's eve in a mistake 
or couldn't make out what it was but all took it in good part for a good sign and were in great joy as for st dennis and old neck an attorney had his foot upon him with an habera a latitat and three executions hanging over em and there's the end of rogues and a great example in the country and no more about it for i can't be wasting more ink upon them that don't deserve it at my hands when i want it for them that do you shall see so some weeks passed and there was great cleaning at clonbrony castle and in the town of clonbrony and the new agent smart and clever and he had the glaziers and the painters and the slaters up and down in the town wherever wanted and you wouldn't know it again thinks i this is no bad sign now cock up your ears pat for the great news is coming and the good the masters come home long life to him and family come home yesterday all entirely the old lord and the young lord ay there's the man paddy and my lady and miss nugent and i driv miss nugent's maid the maid that was and another so i had the luck to be in it along wid him and see all from first to last and first i must tell you my young lord colambre remembered and noticed me the minute he lit at our inn and condescended to beckon at me out of the yard to him and axed me friend larry says he did you keep your promise my oath again the whisky is it says i my lord i surely did says i which was true as all the country knows i never tasted a drop since and i'm proud to see your honour my lord as good as your word too and back again among us so then there was a call for the horses and no more at that time passed betwixt my young lord and me but that he pointed me out to the old one as i went off i noticed and thanked him for it in my heart though i did not know all the good that was to come of it well no more of myself for the present ah you saw i driv him well and we all got to the great gate of the park before sunset and as fine an evening as ever you see with the sun shining on the tops of the trees as the ladies noticed the leaves changed but not dropped though so late in the season i believe the leaves knew what they were about and kept on on purpose to welcome them and the birds were singing and i stopped whistling that they might hear them but sorrow bit could they hear when they got to the park gate for there was such a crowd and such a shout as you never see and they had the horses off every carriage entirely and drew em home with blessings through the park and god bless em when they got out they didn't go shut themselves up in the great drawing-room but went straight out to the terrace to satisfy the eyes and hearts that followed them my lady leaning on my young lord and miss grace nugent that was the beautifulest angel that ever you set eyes on with the finest complexion and sweetest of smiles leaning upon the old lord's arm who had his hat off bowing to all and noticing the old tenants as he passed by name oh there was great gladness and tears in the midst for joy i could scarce keep from myself after a turn or two upon the terrace my lord colambre quit his mother's arm for a minute and he come to the edge of the slope and looked down and through all the crowd for some one is it the widow o'neill my lord says i she's yonder with the spectacles on her nose betwixt her son and daughter as usual then my lord beckoned and they did not know which of the tree would stir but then he gave three beckons with his own finger and they all three came fast enough to the bottom of the slope for nent my lord and he went down and helped the widow up oh he's the true gentleman and brought him all three up on the terrace to my lady and miss nugent and i was up close after that i might hear which wasn't manners but i couldn't help it so what he said i don't well know for i could not get near enough after all but i saw my lady smile very kind and take the widow o'neill by the hand and then my lord colambre traduced grace to miss nugent and there was the word namesake and something about a check curtains but whatever it was they was all greatly pleased then my lord colambre turned and looked for brian who had fell back and took him with some commendation to my lord his father and my lord the master said which i didn't know till after that they should have their house and farm at the old rent and at the surprise the widow dropped down dead and there was a cry as for ten bearings 
be quiet says i she's only killed for joy and i went and lift her up for her son had no more strength that minute than the child new-born and grace trembled like a leaf as white as the sheet but not long for the mother came too and was as well as ever when i brought some water which miss nugent handed to her with her own hand that was always pretty and good said the widow lay in her hand upon miss nugent and kind and good to me and mine that minute there was music from below the blind harper o'neill with his harp that struck up gracie nugent and that finished and my lord colambre smilin with the tears standin in his eyes too and the old lord quite wipin his i ran to the terrace brink to bid o'neill play it again but as i run i thought i heard a voice call larry who calls larry says i my lord colambre calls you larry says all at once and four takes me by the shoulders and spins me round there's my young lord callin you larry run for your life so i run back for my life and walked respectful with my hat in my hand when i got near put on your hat my father desires it said my lord colambre the old lord made a sign to that purpose but was too full to speak where's your father continues my young lord he's very old my lord says i i didn't ask you how old he was says he but where is he he's behind the crowd below on account of his infirmities he couldn't walk so fast as the rest my lord says i but his heart is with you if not his body i must have his body too so bring him bodily before us and this shall be your warrant for so doin said my lord jokin for he knows the nature of us paddy and how we love a joke in our hearts as well as if he had lived all his life in ireland and by the same token will for that reason do what he pleases with us and more maybe than a man twice as good that never would smile on us but i'm tellin you of my father i've a warrant for you father says i and must have you bodily before the justice and my lord chief justice so he changed colour a bit at first but he saw me smile and i've done no sin said he and larry you may lead me now as you led me all my life and up the slope he went with me as light as fifteen and when we got up my lord clonbrony said i am sorry an old tenant and a good old tenant as i hear you were should have been turned out of your farm don't fret it's no great matter my lord said my father i shall be soon out of the way but if you would be so kind to speak a word for my boy here and that i could afford while the life is in me to bring my other boy back out of banishment then says my lord clonbrony i'll give you and your sons three lives or thirty-one years from this day of your former farm return to it when you please and added my lord colambre the flaggers i hope will soon be banished oh how could i thank him not a word could i proffer but i know i clasped my two hands and prayed for him inwardly and my father was droppin down on his knees but the master would not let him and observed that posture should only be for his god and sure enough in that posture when he was out of sight we did pray for him that night and will all our days but before we quit his presence he called me back and bid me write to my brother and bring you back if you've no objections to your own country so come my dear pat and make no delay for joy's not joy complete till you're in it my father sends his blessin and peggy her love the family entirely is to settle for good in ireland and there was in the castle yard last night a bonfire made by my lord's orders of the old yellow damask furniture to please my lady my lord says and the drawing-room the butler was tellin me is new hung and the chairs with velvet as white as snow and shaded over with natural flowers by miss nugent oh how i hope what i guess will come true and i've reason to believe it will for i dreamt in my bed last night it did but keep yourself to yourself that miss nugent who is no more miss nugent they say but miss reynolds and has a new-found grandfather and is a big heiress which she did not want in my eyes nor in my young lord's i've a notion will be some time and maybe sooner than is expected my lady viscountess colambre 
so haste to the wedding and there's another thing they say the rich old grandfather's comin over and another thing pat you would not be out of the fashion and you see it's growin the fashion not to be an absentee your lovin brother larry brady end of chapter seventeen end of the absentee by maria edgeworth